Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live Virtual Planetarium. In just a few moments, we will be exploring space with two of our educators today. But before we get started, we want to let you all know that if you need closed captions today, you can get those by selecting closed caption at the bottom of your screen if you're watching on Zoom with us today. And if you would like to ask a question, answer a question, share an observation, you can do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Don't forget to include your name and age if you would like a shout out. Now, if you happen to be watching on YouTube or Facebook, unfortunately, we cannot see your comments or questions today, but we're so happy to have you join us and we hope you enjoy the show. With all of that being said, I'd like to invite our educators to turn on their cameras, introduce themselves, and let's get started. Hey everybody, my name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and I am going to be your presenter today, but I cannot do this by myself. Hi everyone, my name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and I will be your pilot today, flying you around the solar system. And today, if you've been paying any attention to the news in the last 24 hours, you know there's only one space topic worth talking about. And to get us there, we're going to start in space around Earth. So here is our lovely planet Earth. I'm sure you've seen pictures of it from space uh, a lot. And it's very different looking from the other planets in our solar system, largely because it's got these very expansive blue oceans on its surface, just tons of liquid water on the surface of this planet. It's one of the things that makes life on Earth uh, or makes Earth a good place for life as we know it to thrive. It's not just about the liquid water. Things like um, atmosphere play a huge role in that as well. But all that liquid water is one of the major things that makes Earth such a great place to host life. Now, one of the things we humans would love to do is find life out there in a place that is not the Earth, extraterrestrial life. And that for a while there, it was looking like, well, that's not something we're going to find in our solar system. But the more we get to know our solar system, the more our opinions on that kind of change. And there's one place in particular that has really captured our imagination as far as life existing somewhere other than the Earth, and that is Mars. So Katie, let's go ahead and take a jaunt to Mars. By the way, the program Katie is using is called Worldwide Telescope. It is a free program to download, so you can download it onto your computer and fly through the solar system yourself. So as we approach Mars, you're going to see that Mars today does not look at like an especially promising place to look for life. It doesn't look anything like the Earth. It's very, very dry. It has an extremely thin atmosphere. Um, and it's very cold. You can find Katie showing us at the bottom there. You can see one of the little ice caps. Mars does have water, it's just frozen. Um, now, the thing that intrigues us about Mars is that we believe billions of years ago, Mars looked a lot more like the Earth, that it had large bodies of liquid water on its surface and a much thicker, nicer atmosphere than it has today. And we do think that back when it looked like that, Mars would have had the right conditions to support life. And so one of the reasons we love to keep sending um, spacecraft to Mars is, well, it's for a couple of reasons. First of all, Mars is the easiest planet for us to get a spacecraft to, but we really want to see if we can find any evidence of past life on Mars. Now, we wouldn't be talking little green men. We would be talking about microbes, bacteria. And we legit, legitimately think there's a chance that we can find fossilized bacteria on Mars. And that maybe having developed life once, there even could be pockets deep down under the crust where conditions are still okay to support that kind of life. This is something that we've found on Earth is that once life gets a start somewhere, it seems to fill every single nook and cranny of the planet. We have found life on Earth in places that we used to think would not have been able to support it. So that's why we get very excited about Mars as a place where life maybe could have existed in the past. But if we're gonna talk about places where we think life could exist in the solar system right now, 
Mars isn't the best bet. To do that, we actually want to go farther from the sun out into the colder reaches of the solar system. Katie, can you just maybe drop us by Jupiter? A little jaunt to Jupiter. Now, Jupiter, you might be saying, why, why Jupiter? Jupiter is a gas planet. Um, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, these are all gas giants, which means they don't really have a solid surface. So we believe that it is not, based on what we know right now, that it is not possible for life to form in the clouds of a gas giant. But it's not Jupiter that we're actually excited about. It's these white lines that are going all around the all around Jupiter, those are the orbits of its moons. And Jupiter has a couple of very interesting moons, most especially the moon Europa. Europa is one of the larger moons of Jupiter and it actually has a thick crust of ice on its surface. So it doesn't have an atmosphere, but underneath that crust of ice is an ocean of liquid water. And we believe there is actually more liquid water under the surface of Europa than there is on the surface of Earth. And life as we know it needs liquid water. He's going and flying us all the way up to Europa, which is great. You'll be able to see that crust of ice. And so if we think liquid water is necessary for life, well, Europa has a lot of it below the surface. And we actually think Europa may be the best place in the solar system to look for life. Now it's not the only moon that we think could support life. There are moons of Saturn that we think would have a similar chance of supporting life, either because they have underground oceans of liquid water or because they have lakes of uh, liquid methane on their surface. So Titan is one of Saturn's moons. It has Lakes, lakes on its surface, they're just liquid methane instead of liquid water. Your Enceladus is a moon of Saturn that has, like Europa, a liquid water underground ocean. And that's a place, like Europa, where we can imagine life as we know it surviving. We actually think there are life forms that already we know about here on Earth, that if we could transport them to Enceladus or to Europa, that they would survive. So there's a lot of prospects for uh, place or places that get us excited about the possibility of life because you know they're places that have some Earth-like aspect to them. But now we're going to get to the big news that came out yesterday, and we're going to do that by going to a place that is not Earth-like at all. Katie, let's go ahead and visit the highly unpleasant world of Venus. So Venus is the second planet from the sun. It is the hottest planet. It's got this thick, 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 thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. And that atmosphere acts like a blanket. The surface of Venus is hot enough to melt lead. And that's what you're looking at here is the surface as opposed to um, a cloud layer. This is, if you could see the surface of Venus, this is what it would look like. Uh, in actuality, if you flew up to Venus, you would not be able to see the surface. All you would see is the top of the clouds. And the surface is hot enough to melt lead. The weight of all that atmosphere on top of you, with it's something, the pressure is something like this, a similar pressure on Earth is found like half a mile deep in the ocean, something like that. Um, we believe there are volcanoes going off all over the place. And the clouds are made of sulfuric acid. So when I say that Venus is an extremely unpleasant place, I mean it is really, really, really bad. No water. It's one of the it's drier than the driest place on Earth by a factor of about 50. So extremely dry, exceedingly hot, acid clouds, volcanoes going off. We have landed spacecraft on the surface of Venus. And I think the record holder for the longest lasting right now is about two hours. That is how long the longest lasting spacecraft on the surface of Venus made it. Because there is no way for me to underrepresent what an unpleasant place Venus is. But that's the surface. 
And the funny thing is, uh, that's Venus today. Venus, we believe, if you go back in time enough, has a history kind of like Mars. I think if you go back in time far enough, Mar or Venus had liquid water on its surface. We don't know if that would have been in the form of lakes or oceans, but we think that Venus went through a temperate period where it was a nice, pleasant temperature on the surface of Venus. And it's even possible that this temperate period on Venus lasted for longer than the temperate period on Mars, which means there would have been a longer window for life to potentially develop on Venus. Now, of course, today, like I said, Venus is a horror show, but that's at the surface. If you go up into the atmosphere at a height of about 50 kilometers or about 35 miles, there's actually a layer of clouds where the temperature is very pleasant. Um, and it's, like I said, it's about 35 miles up and the temperature is very similar to temperatures you would see on Earth. And a, the big news, the big news that came out yesterday was that a group of astronomers who had been studying Venus found evidence of a rare molecule called phosphine. That's P-H-O-S-P-H-I-N-E, phosphine. And in, in higher amounts than they would have expected, and they found it at that height in that temperate cloud layer where the temperature is nice. Now, this is where things get really exciting. Phosphine has a couple of ways that it can be formed that we know about. Uh, we know it can form deep in the atmospheres of the gas giants like Saturn and Jupiter. So that's not what's going on here because uh, Venus doesn't have the right pressures. Uh, we, we can produce it industrially here on the Earth. And clearly that's not what the source is on Venus. There are a couple of things like lightning, volcanoes, uh, meteorite impacts. These things can produce tiny amounts of phosphine. So the team um, that discovered this, made this discovery, did the calculation to figure out is this, could all of this phosphine be coming from um, processes like that? And the answer is no. There is too much phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus to be being produced this way. Then there was the question of, could this be phosphine left over from the period of time when Venus was a nice temperate place, which ended about a billion years ago? And the answer is no. Phosphine would degrade over about a thousand years, which means something is continuously producing this phosphine. It's not any of the non-biological processes that we know about, which leaves the biological ones. We know that there are life forms here on earth, microbes, bacteria, that produce phosphine when there is no oxygen in the environment, which is Venus. Venus has no oxygen. It's got a lot of carbon dioxide, but no loose oxygen. And that is potentially very, very exciting because that means we don't know of a non-biological way for all this phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus to be created, which could mean that we have found evidence that there might be microbial life in the atmosphere of Venus. Now that sounds like a crazy idea, right? How could life exist only in the atmosphere? And it's not actually a crazy idea. It's not a new idea even at Venus. We've known for a while that there was this temperate zone in Venus's atmosphere. And we have known, uh, for instance, that there are certain wavelengths of light ultraviolet light that get blocked in Venus's atmosphere by something, clouds of something that are about the size of a bacteria. So we already knew there were clouds of bacteria sized somethings in Venus's atmosphere blocking ultraviolet light. And now we discover that there is a, a uh, gas that we associate entirely with microbes 
here on the earth. Does that mean that we have discovered life in the universe? No, that's not what this means. It means we've discovered phosphine, but this is potentially very, very exciting. Like I said, it is a, it's one of the biggest indicators yet of what we call a biomarker. So these are things that we would look for, for instance, when we're looking at planets and other solar systems at exoplanets, we would be looking for what we call biomarkers, things that we could detect at a distance that would be byproducts of life existing on that planet. Phosphine could be a biomarker and something is continuously producing it in the clouds of Venus at a height that we know is a nice temperature. Now that again, doesn't necessarily mean we've overcome all the obstacles. Like I said, Venus is extremely dry, drier by a factor of 50 than the driest place on the earth. And all life as we know it needs water, liquid water to survive. That's why we get very excited about places such as Europa or Enceladus because they have liquid water. Venus has none, zero. And that would mean that this would be, have to be a kind of life that could survive completely without liquid water, which is not a form of life that we understand if it exists. Also, this life, whatever it would be, would be living in the clouds of Venus, which again are made of sulfuric acid. It's about 90% sulfuric acid. So whatever it is would also have to live in an environment that is basically completely unconducive to any life as we know it. There is no form of life that we know that could survive in this environment. Unlike again, Europa and Enceladus and places like that where we can imagine a form of life that would be able to survive there. So does this mean we've discovered life? No, because there's a lot of other obstacles that life would have to overcome to be able to survive in this environment. But we found a really exciting indicator um, and what we've discovered means, if, even if this isn't life, it means something that we don't know is producing this phosphine. It means we've discovered a completely new form of chemistry happening on Venus, or possibly that we've discovered life. Either one of those is a very, very exciting discovery. One of them is obviously a little bit more exciting than the other. Now, Venus is a planet that um, has not been explored all that much because it can be very difficult to get to. You would think it's, it's the next planet in. It must be it's like just going next door. But because it's closer to the sun, any spacecraft that we send to Venus is actually getting increasingly pulled on by the sun, which causes it to speed up. So we can't directly send a spacecraft to Venus. It would be going way too fast by the time it got there and it would just fly right by the planet. So to send a spacecraft to Venus, we actually have to do a long, slow spiral into Venus through the inner solar system and it takes years to get there. And like we've said, it is kind of a hostile environment. So there is a spacecraft there right now, Akatsuki, it is a Japanese mission. And there are two missions currently competing for funding, um, which could potentially be the next NASA mission to Venus. There has not been a NASA mission to Venus since the Magellan spacecraft, which launched in 1989. Um, but there are two others named Veritas and Da Vinci, which are um, competing for funding. And if they get that funding, they could become the next um, NASA missions to Venus, our sister planet, which is about the same size as Earth. I didn't mention that earlier, but it is almost exactly the same size as Earth and um, could potentially shed some more light on just what's going on in the clouds of Venus. Now, I have to admit, I really love this theory. I, I really hope it's true. First of all, I think it would be, it, any discovery of life outside of Earth would be utterly fantastic. And I also think it would be kind of hilarious if after focusing on places like Mars and Enceladus and Europa and dismissing Venus for all those years, it would turn out that it's Venus that we find life on first. I think that would be hilarious as well as extremely exciting. Now, once again, we have not found life on Venus. We have found phosphine. 
phosphine is potentially exciting because the only way we can currently think of to produce it in the amounts that we see on Venus is biologically. Doesn't mean there's not a non-biological way that we're not thinking of, but it is potentially extremely exciting. And it looks like we might have some questions, Christina. I don't wanna, I, I wanna leave time for questions. So I'm gonna stop talking for the moment. Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so let me see. I'll start with an easy one, just in terms of reference in space. As Katie has been rotating around here, um, there is an object in the sky that looks like a star cluster. And uh, Amy wanted to know, what is this small star cluster just well, when she saw it to the left of Venus, kind of blue, sort of looks like a dipper. There you that go, is, you got it. That is the Pleiades star cluster, which you can see very easily from Earth in the winter months. So, you know, if you want to see it with your own eyes, you can go out in the winter months and spot it. Uh, like you notice, it's, it's almost looks like a little tiny dipper. And because it's a little cluster like that, your eye tends to be drawn to it. So it's very um, relatively easy to spot. It'll be uh, to the west of Orion, and it's part of Taurus the Bull in terms of constellations. Awesome. Thank you for that reference. It'll be fun to look for that too tonight. And looks like we have a couple of questions about maybe what else you can find in the atmosphere of Venus, specifically if there are clouds of methane and or sulfur. So you're not, methane is not something that we see a lot of on um, Venus. Um, I'm not sure about sulfur. There's clearly sulfur um, of some sort because um, there is sulfuric acid in, in the clouds. The clouds are largely made of sulfuric acid, but I don't think you're really going to find um, clouds of sulfur. It tends to exist in its acid form, which again is a major problem for any form of life that wants to try and exist in the clouds of Venus. They have to be able to exist surrounded by acid constantly, which again is not a condition that any life that we know of could survive. Excellent. And thinking about maybe the temperature of Venus, um, Jane would like to know if it's hot enough on Venus to melt a diamond. Probably not to melt a diamond. Diamonds are extremely, extremely durable. Um, and I, I have no idea what the melting point of a diamond would be, um, but it is hotter than your oven. So it's about 800 degrees, give or take on the surface of Venus, hot, hot enough to melt most metals, um, hotter than your oven. It's just a really, you, you wouldn't want to build a vacation home there. It's a very unpleasant place, Venus. All right, no taken, Talia. I won't be booking that trip anytime soon. And for our next question, um, Brad wanted to know, are Venus and Jupiter affected in any way by black holes in our solar system? So I have the great fortune to say that none of the planets in our solar system are being affected by uh, a black hole. There are no black holes close to us. The nearest one is about a thousand light years away. Um, so not close at all. Um, and that's a relatively small one. Now, the closest that any of them are to being affected by a black hole is the one at the very, very center of the Milky Way, which is our, the Milky Way is our galaxy. And at the center of it, there is a supermassive black hole. And that affects the whole galaxy because the galaxy is spinning around it, just like the solar system spins around the sun. Um, but that is the only way in which we are even remotely affected by a black hole. And it's good because without that black hole there, we think the Milky Way would not have formed. We think it wouldn't have evolved into the galaxy that it is today. Very likely our solar system would not have formed. So the one at the center, the big, the big one at the center of the Milky Way is doing us all a favor by existing. And then anything closer to home is um, too far away to have any kinds of effect. And generally black holes don't have much of an effect anyway, except with, except gravitationally. Um, and you'd have to be very, very close to a black hole in order to be harmed by it. You'd have to be very, very, very close to it. And like I said, the nearest one is a thousand light years away. So black holes are not a thing we really have to worry about in our day-to-day -day life. 
Excellent. And I think we actually only have one more question that I can see. Oh, maybe two. <laughs> one just popped in. Um, but let's take a look. Um, thinking about maybe some of our planets or exoplanets, um, we have a question about um, why or whether you consider Pluto to be a planet and also how close the planets we talked about today would be to some of those further planets like Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune. So um, I personally do not consider Pluto a planet. Um, it's that crazy white line that you can see. It's got the weird orbit. Um, so its orbit does not look like the orbit of a planet. And Katie, maybe you can turn us sideways so we can see how, um, how tilted Pluto's orbit is compared to the orbit. The planet orbits actually kind of form a line and Pluto um, is very tilted. It does not fit that line. And um, it doesn't look like the orbit, uh, it doesn't look like any of the planets. So you've got the small rocky worlds um, in the inner solar system. You have the big gas giants in the outer solar system and Pluto doesn't fit any of those molds. It's a little ball of ice and rock. It's only about half the size of the United States. So it's really tiny. It would fit inside uh, our moon with hundreds of miles to I'm spare. Just get us back into space. Sorry, my uh, it crashed for a moment there. So it happens. <laughs> and um, so Pluto does not look like a planet, and it does not act like a planet. But there is a group of objects that Pluto does look and act like, and that's the Kuiper Belt. So out where Pluto lives, there is another group of objects. It's kind of like the asteroid belt, only it's much further out. And it is out where Pluto is. And these are little tiny icy objects in tilted oval orbits, which is exactly what Pluto is. So Pluto, if an alien descended on our solar system today and saw Pluto, they probably would not classify it with the planets. They would count it as a member of the Kuiper belt. And so that's what we did. We decided it didn't look and act like a, a planet. It looks and acts like a Kuiper belt object it probably makes sense to call it a Kuiper Belt object instead of a planet. And what was the other part of that question? It was... Um, Thinking about, I think, distance and just how far some of those outer planets are from the ones we were looking at more closely today. They're very, very far. Jupiter is the closest planet of the gas giants to us, and it's about 500 million miles away. Now, to compare, as a comparison, um, Mars's orbit is about 50 million miles away. So Jupiter is 10 times as far away from us as Mars is. And it's the close one. Awesome. Well, thank you, Talia and Katie, for doing this amazing sort of trip through space today. It does look like we are just about out of time for our show today. So I was hoping Katie could also turn her camera on and Talia and Katie could say goodbye. Bye, Bye everyone. And thank you to our audience today for joining this program. Um, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to your question, but what I can say is that if you would like to see more programs like this and have another opportunity to ask questions, whether that be about astronomy or any of the other topics we covered throughout the week, you can go ahead and check out all of our virtual offerings if you visit our website at www.mos.org slash MOS at home. Also, if you would like to support the Museum of Science, you can find more information about that by visiting engage.mos.org slash welcome. And if you would like to try out this software that we use for the program today for yourself, you can do so for free if you visit the website www.world, excuse me, worldwidetelescope.org. So we hope you enjoyed the program. Thank you so much for joining and we'll catch you at the next one.